Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. When Donald Trump vowed to reinstate stop and frisk across the country, saying it worked so well in New York, he stomped into a sensitive debate, typically absent any sense of nuance or awareness of the facts. At its peak, stop and frisk saw almost 700,000 New Yorkers, overwhelmingly black and Latino and young, stopped on the streets. The stop, seemingly random, with no link to reasonable suspicions of the person stopped, yielded gun seizures in just one-tenth of one percent of the cases. And as the number of stops dropped to around 20,000 last year under Commissioner Bratton, crime continued to drop, and that has eased some of the corrosive effect the stops had on the relationship between the police departments and communities of color. But the widely publicized cases of unarmed men and women of color killed by police officers across the country have deepened that divide. Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton has met with leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement that emerged in response to the cases and campaigned with mothers of the men and women who died at the hands of police, including the mother of Eric Garner, an unarmed man killed on a Staten Island sidewalk in the summer of 2014 by an officer who video showed used an outlaw chokehold. Just this month, Deborah Danner, a 66-year-old schizophrenic, was fatally shot by a police sergeant in the Bronx who said she was armed with a scissors and a baseball bat. Both Mayor de Blasio and new police commissioner James O'Neill quickly said the officer did not follow department protocol when confronting emotionally disturbed people by trying to use less than lethal force and calling in the emergency services unit. Police union officials have bitterly lashed out at O'Neill and de Blasio, charging them with second-guessing officers facing what they perceive as their own life and death situations. And it's not just civilians who've been killed. In July, five Dallas police officers and, and three from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, were killed in ambushes while protecting peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters. New York saw officers uh, Rafael Ramos and, and uh, Wenjin Liu gunned down in Bedford-Stuyvesant 20 months ago by a man who traveled from Maryland and to avenge, in his mind, the failure of a Staten Island grand jury to indict the officer who killed Eric Garner. Just this week, the Federal Justice Department took over the case from the local FBI office in what appears to be an attempt to formulate civil rights charges against the officer in the Garner case. Commissioner O'Neill, a veteran New York cop, is the architect of NYPD's shift to a community policing model that aims at normalizing relations with, with communities by getting officers out of their car and into the regular contact with civilians. What is clear is that perceptions of safety do not always, do not always track uh, declining crime statistics. That is likely to factor into next year's mayoral race as it has in the current presidential race. We're joined tonight by four New Yorkers who take part in the debates about, uh, surrounding the relationship between police and the communities they serve. Eleanor Tatum is the editor of the Amsterdam News. Arnold Chris is a lawyer in Manhattan and former deputy commissioner for trials in the New York City Police Department. Eugene O'Donnell is a professor in the Department of Law, Police Science and Criminal Justice Administration at John Jay College. And Rory Lansman is a city councilman from Queens who is a member of both the Committee on Public Safety and the Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice. Gene, let me start with you. We're going to lose Gene in about a half an hour, so I, so I, so I appreciate the time. Um, there's been a shift in strategy from the whole stop and frisk confrontation aspect to trying to get cops out of their cars, a community policing model. You're, you are suspicious of the effectiveness of that. Well, the big news in the country, and New York is different, we're t just take us out because we're a super rich city at this point, and every single neighborhood's doing well, but in other parts of the country, and even in New York, the big news is the collapse of policing as a profession. Nobody wants to go in there. Nobody wants to stay in there. Nobody wants to be involved in proactive policing. With the advent of cameras, I think the police are going to have to think very long and hard about interacting with people. This is just starting to now filter in. The political establishment, which has completely failed in so many ways, imposed these cameras. No way, no how would that have been a community issue. And that is, that is the issue we face right now. New York City Police Department's recruiting is a disaster. The cops are f f flying out the door and just trying to keep people on the job is, a, is an awfully hard thing, a national phenomenon. You have cops... City after city is losing police people, and there's no plan to get it back. The Kerner Commission 50 years ago said cops should have a four-year degree. 50 years ago, 1% of police departments have that because it's laughably out of, out of touch. So I did three of these in the last couple of weeks, and there's a certain number of people who just want to keep talking. Well, that's a big issue. So how do we fix that <coughs> issue? Uh, we need a police department. Where is it going to come from? Unless you're an abolitionist, which we have people 
who pose as reformers, but they really want to see the police abolished. And that's a, that's a whole other conversation. Um, Eleanor, in uh, um, we were talking before the show about some changes that were made in the uh, that have that have just been that are that are now being made in the ninth precinct on the Lower East Side. How would how would communities react to seeing police officers out of their cars in a more normal, given you know uh, give and take where you know that person not just as a person in blue but as a human being and who they are and their name, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, during the David Dinkins administration, when they did have community policing, it was looked on as something positive. And during the Giuliani administration, it was really taken away. And police really got put in back into their police cars. And you really did not have any interaction between police and the community. And that's when Stop and Frisk really got its, its start and its, uh, uh, and its rise in... Uh, in happening over 700,000 times in a year. And uh, with that became more and more distrust of the community and the police. And so at this point in time, there is so much fixing that needs to get done. And so this is just a beginning. And so some people are gonna look at it with open arms, others are gonna look at it very skeptically. And the, the idea of having police that are actually going to be talking to you as people and not as suspects is something that's almost novel now, which is really unfortunate. But, you know, from the presentation that I was able to see last night down in the Ninth Precinct, which is down in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, they're putting police officers out there that are out there to really get to know the community. And they're out there to be a part of the community. Some of the officers are actually from the community. And uh, it looks like it's something that could be promising, but you, you never know until it actually goes into practice. I'm, I'm optimistic, but you know, time only will, time will tell. Arnie, you've uh, uh, been in a unique position in terms of actually prosecuting police officers when you were in the in, in departmental trials, um, Gene is making the point that, and the police unions are making the point about the second guessing of police officers who are in life and death situations. And, you know, when a firefighter comes, when you come in touch with a firefighter, he's there to save you. When you, when you, when you come in touch with a police officer, it's inherently a confrontation. Uh, that's true. First of all, um, I didn't prosecute police officers in the police department. I judged them. I was deputy commissioner of trials. So every cop who got charges and specifications and civilians would appear in front of me for a, a diverse number of uh, violations. If you And I was a prosecutor as an assistant DA. I did prosecute a cop for murder, which is a separate story. And I've also defended uh, police officers. So the old expression of police officers' lot is not a happy one. Well, a lot of it has to do with the rules and regulations every single day they're facing. It is a book, maybe this big. Uh, it's called The Patrol Guide. And in there, if it's losing your hat or not wearing your hat, at least I think that's the way it used to be, losing your radio, uh, failure to make a memo book entry, right up to excessive force, you could be found guilty and lose your job, depending on the seriousness, or lose days vacations. So the New York Police Department has these rules and police officers out on the street have to be held accountable. There's no question about that. The community demands it. We all demand it uh, as uh, taxpayers that they do their job also. When they don't do their job and they receive departmental discipline, it should be done swiftly. A message should be sent out to not only the members of the department, but it, the public has the right to know how the police department disciplines its police officers. Because in essence, we need to know this because our friends, our family, our kids run into cops and we only want good, hardworking cops out there. So it's a tough job cops have. And at the end of the day, if they do their job right, not perfectly, because no one is perfect, except me, I'm a perfect lawyer, but that's not true either. The bottom line really is when you do your job right and you basically service the community or the customers, it's a retail business out there that you deal with, I think everybody is going to be satisfied, but not 100%. Uh, Rory, a lot of this comes into your office. You talk to your constituents, and there is this tension between people who want more cops but, but object when they're into, you know, but, but often object when they're into the confrontation. Setting aside for now the, uh, you know, videotape murders of unarmed people, which is kind of an extreme 
uh, and very real issue that has kind of focused huge amount of attention. But I mean, what do you hear from constituents? So my main hat in the city council is I, I chair the Committee on Courts and Legal Services. So between that and the committees that I sit on, which were mentioned in the opening, um, have the opportunity to see and, and oversee pretty much the entire criminal justice system from, from soup to nuts. And the first stab I'll, I'll take at answering that question is by stepping back a little bit and confronting the reality that our criminal justice system from start to finish falls uh, unequally and disproportionately on people of color. And so for the communities that I represent, and my district is in Queens, uh, the neighborhoods around downtown Jamaica, St. John's University, Queens College, uh, it's about a third white. Um, you have to see the policing issues that we at the council are trying to uh, address through that lens. I mean, today my committee had a hearing on what the city is doing or has failed to do to prevent more uh, instances of uh, Khalif Browder, who was in jail for three years uh, without getting the opportunity to have a trial uh, before charges against him were finally dismissed. And he committed so, suicide. And he ended up committing suicide, and then um, last week or within the last couple of weeks, his, his mother passed away. So, um, and last night I was at the 103rd Police Precinct Community Council, which is the police precinct that um, oversees uh, uh, Jamaica and, and, and Point South. And um, there was a conversation about uh, community policing, um, the level of policing that is appropriate. The short answer to your question, now focusing in, is communities of color want to live in orderly, peaceful, um, safe communities, just like everybody else. Um, but because of a long history of um, over-policing, which has produced the mass incarceration and, and over-criminalization that, that we, the whole country is trying to grapple with, right now, um, navigating how you have a, a, a safe community, but one that is safe both from the bad guys as well as safe for ordinary law-abiding individuals to interact with police officers is an enormous challenge. And it's one that has to be thought through and navigated um, very carefully. And, um, Eleanor, um uh, Gene brought up the uh, brought up the issue of police cameras. Obviously, the videotaping of uh, some of these murders, uh, whether it's in New York or elsewhere, has really brought a huge amount of attention on the racial overlay of of this of this debate. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, you know, he talks about the over criminalization, the over incarceration, and there is clearly a racial divide. In yeah, there, I mean, there absolutely is a racial divide on the way policing is done as well. But one of the things that we also have to be very careful of is there were a lot of people that talk about when communities start talking about the problems with policing that they don't want police. And that is not the case. But they want to be safe from the bad factors that are in their communities, but they also want to be safe from the bad elements in the police departments as well. Now, we know that there are good police officers. We also know that there are good people in every community. We just have to make sure that the good people in the community get to deal with good police officers, and even the bad people in communities get to deal with good police officers who are going to be fair and just. Because if we have bad policing, that affects everybody, and it affects everybody negatively. And it especially affects people of color negatively because that's where the over-policing tends to occur. And that's where we see more and more arrests, more and more bad arrests. And that's where we see the over-population uh, of prisons coming from. And it is a lot of those bad arrests. I mean, look at Rikers Island, for instance, and the fact that, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do with Rikers now. A lot of that has to do with the way New York City polices. It's not just what Rikers Island is, but it's how people end up getting there. Gene, you, um, police officers have a great deal of frustration, um, but, you know, that's always been the case. Uh, it's, you know, there is a kind of a blue line of, there's kind of a blue culture, if you, you know, if, if you will. Um, and... Um, how do they react to all of this? Well, I mean, 90% of the New York City cops say they would never recommend the job. Uh, political leaders have grandstanded uh, shamefully. Uh, every time a law is passed, that is, that is, that is coercive. 
right? So the way law is enforced is ultimately through force. That doesn't mean you have to use force, but that's what the police do. It makes them different than everybody else. And you hear people going on and on and on about um, the, 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 this whole idea of the use of force, like it's, per, it's abusive to be using force. The police are willing to use daily force. Uh, again, they self-select, there are surrogates, they go into harm's way. When they pull you over for a traffic uh, issue, they're not making a request for your license, they're making a demand. That's not, He's technically it's an arrest. It's an arrest, you're not free to go. Now, has any lawmaker stood up and said this? Oh, we, we need the, to re-legitimize the police. It said what? It said that, well, do you own, City Council of New York, for example, has been shamefully grandstanding on the Eric Garner case, and it's really outrageous. The City Council is suggesting, and, we, you know, put that case aside, there's, there's no, unless they have a solution, when you have a situation where the police are going to make an arrest and a person does not want to come, okay, assuming you cannot talk to that person, and we're not saying that that's necessarily the case in Staten Island. The city council is masquerading as an organization that somehow can find a way to get people into custody who don't want to come into custody. And you talked about the courts. I mean, we could go on and on about how many parts of our system are fundamentally broken, our political <coughs> system. Court system is a disaster. And the city council has gone on and on and on taking on, really grandstanding against the cops. But I mean, and you cheap started- shotting the, Well, it's just but, important no, to say this. But you started- they, they should be helping. And what are you doing to help recruitment? But, what so, do you help oh, to okay. get a four year- I want to I I, finish this I wanna because it's very important yeah. that, are, uh, you, uh, what are we doing to get people to go into the police service? What are you guys doing to sell that, to get a four year degree, mm -hmm. and, to be, and to be frank and honest with people and tell them policing is an <laughs> adversarial, conflictive job when it's done. And, and there's no way to get around that. That's why some people like neighborhood policing, because they think you can sort of do a detour around the conflict of an adversarial part. And just one other thing, it's, again, worth saying, New York City Police Department has, a, has an ability to put crimes in the city on a map, okay, including murder, and we don't have much of a murder problem. Has anybody ever seen the murder map of some of the biggest cities in the country? Okay, if you put uh, 10 years of murders on a map in Philadelphia, there's whole neighborhoods you can't see. And those crimes are not being solved. Okay, but so police are actually afraid to go out and solve the crimes. 80% of shootings, 3,000 in Chicago, unsolved. And the, and the amount of attention that's been given to bashing the cops is amazing. Ironically, they're among the most respected professions in the country compared to politicians and lawyers. Okay, they, they have a seven, the highest confidence rate in the police after a multi-billion dollar bashing campaign to them with elected officials and the media for two years where are the police sitting? Right. Seventy percent of people. But, but, so but, but as, I just want to know as who, the, is, who has that confidence in the police. What color are the people that have the? confidence I was just in, in the Philadelphia. Police? Okay, so new poll in Philadelphia. First of all, fear is the num fear of public safety is the number one issue. Catapult it. Why? I think people know, and you may have seen it in New York City. Whether you think it's not an issue or not, something like aggressive panhandling, that scares people. They don't like that. They don't like when they go to the bank. I, no, I didn't ask who. No, no. Scared, I, I, but, I, but, so, but, but, here, here are the numbers. Here are the numbers in Philly. Almost half the city is afraid. The police have a 72 percent of poverty, 60 percent of the African American community, 60 percent of the Latino community. How does that compare to political people who aren't even known? Wait, wait, well, I, 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 don't the, I don't care about the. I don't care about the. So, um, as the author of the chokehold bill, right. which would criminalize the use of a chokehold, I guess I would qualify as the chief grandstander. You, on you the, would on the guard. Indeed, indeed, you would. So let's talk frankly about it. I think what people have an expectation is that. When the police interact with someone who um, they suspect has committed a crime, that they will use the least amount of force that is necessary right. to restrain that person. As we know, and Can I just when somebody wait, wait, refuses, wait, 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 wait. When when I, refuses I, when I, when tell I, me the magic way. No, it's important. Let's cut to the chase. I, tell me the magic way that you would put Gene, somebody in custody so, who does Gene, not let want to go. Let him finish. So, him, as the police department itself has had on the books in its patrol guide for decades, it is impermissible for an officer to use a chokehold. Full stop. So when all of us can watch a man being choked to death for the alleged crime of selling loose cigarettes and for offering really as resistant, you, you know, uh, really as resistant, you know as resistant, as resistant, as resistance goes, don't go over the nuance. as resistance you know goes, a minimal amount of resistance. When we watch that person, that man, Eric Garner, being choked to death from an improper chokehold, 
we as policymakers responding to the, the, the will and expectations of the public that we represent ask ourselves if the patrol guide already makes the use of a chokehold impermissible and it is still being used, what next do we have to do to deter officers from using do a those public kind service, of Wait. Do a public service and tell the cops how to make an arrest when somebody doesn't want to be it. Tell them affirmatively how That's to do it. That's what they have an academy for. Oh, so the academy does it. They have an academy. You know, they have it, a patrol guide. You're we paving do, over the nuance, and that is grandstanding. There's, there's no, you know, there's no nuance. We watched, you know, watched a man get choked. We watched a man get choked to death. There's no nuance. We watched a man get choked to death using an impermissible choke. That's grandstanding. But this, you did it but again. this whole conversation is so upsetting because you know, one of the things that you started saying was, when a cop makes a traffic stop, right? Mm-hmm. But when there is a young man of color sitting behind that wheel with tears in his eyes because he knows he's done nothing wrong and he is afraid that he's going to get shot to death just because there is a guy at his window that has perceived that he may be a criminal. Well, now, that is not the we, way that our community well, we should the, be we living. Have a, well, we have an alternative problem now. The police are not doing stops. That's a bigger issue. And the lawmaker should own no, well, but Gene, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You help create is... this environment, and we have a national phenomenon, and the city council of New York has helped do it. The you Times just it. had, excuse me, the, the, you know, the Times just had, because what you're talking about, whether it's an explicit bias, there's also a tremendous amount of... Implicit imp bias. Implicit bias. I mean, you have to deal, you know, you've got to be in a position of judging the actions. Well, first of all, let, let me, I feel like I'm in a line of fire here. Uh, so I need some protection, Kevlar. Uh, I heard what the council member said. Uh, first of all, let me just say this outwardly. The Garner case, I've watched that tape over and over and over. Uh, it, to me, it was horrifying. And I saw a lot of stuff as what I consider myself a professional law enforcement, trial lawyer, judge on both sides. So I don't condone anything that I've seen in the tape. I believe that he was taken down for a crime, uh, that he never should have been uh, held in that fashion. I saw also a knee put on his neck when he was crying out, I can't breathe. Uh, but in the final analysis, I believe the grand jury of Staten Island heard the case. My view is that I thought it should have been a criminally negligent homicide indictment. Whether it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt is a different story. I believe a jury of 12 people should have made a decision on it. But it didn't happen that way. So, you know, you have to take the law and you have to accept it. Let me just switch over to the federal government. The United States Attorney's Office of the Eastern District has a case that they have been reviewing called the Garnet case. Officer Pantaleo is the subject of that investigation. The Eastern District is a phenomenally great U.S. Attorney's Office. They believe, I guess, from reading the gossip columns, that's what the Times, the News, and the Post are reporting because it's coming from unknown sources. So let's take it as a fact. They've got to prove in a federal civil rights violation of a police officer that he willfully, willfully caused, in this case, the death of Errol, uh, Eric Gardner. It's very difficult to prove willful. You look at the tape, it is a lot of things. Like I said, I believe it was criminally negligent, but it may not be willful. But this is going to be up, for the, up to the U.S. attorney, now the Department of Justice, to make a determination. The council member talks about a law for the city council. Honestly, I have not read the law, but I'm a lawyer, cut through and through, and I believe the legislature up in Albany will have to define whether or not a chokehold is illegal, not the city council. Because frankly, it is an administrative violation. If you look at that tape, if I was the trial commissioner and I would look at it, I would have to make the judgment whether or not this is a chokehold, whether or not there was a justification for using it. Did his arm slip? Do I really like what happened when he was on the ground? As I said before, what troubled me was his knee was on Mr. Garner's neck. So I look at it totally. Was excessive use used? And if that happens, and if a police officer, in my view, takes the life of an individual wrongfully, departmentally, he does not deserve to be a New York City police could, officer. Could I That's add, my view. Could I, sure. could I just add to that very briefly? And I'm a tough guy when it comes to that. Well, I mean, but the, look, the, the, fact is, the fact is that uh, more than ever before now, the police, when the police use force on people, they are not automatically protected. They have to talk their way out of that. They have to justify it after the fact. They are essentially committing something that for other people would be a criminal act, okay? 
you're going to put a camera on the cops now. Again, I, I don't know how many people here have been even in an argument, much less a physical confrontation. If you have been in such a, a thing, and if you live in New York, you probably have, you know how quickly things can deteriorate. You know how quickly things can, can, can uh, fall apart. The idea that the cops have some magical training to be able to do this, they do not. In fact, ironically, we don't hire police people for physical abilities to do anything. That's not really a requirement for the job. We have de-emphasized physical ability. So if there comes a witching hour where the cops have to actually use force, they don't want to, want to they, they don't, they're not able to, I, just, I would just say we need to find solutions to real problems, which are hard, involving the community and the police, but the, the idea of, of, of cheap shotting the police as a, way f as a way forward in this city or any other city, it's a bad way to go, and it's politically a bad way to go, because the police turn out to be very popular. But I don't, I don't think when you, people Because people know they do come, and they roll up their sleeves, and they do the best they can. And I was involved with arrests, and I don't know if anybody in the room has been involved in arrests. They are unpredictable. People do not, you never know what an arrest situation, zero. And the idea that, again, the cops would not say this was a chokehold. If you know the way they, the chokehold has, has an actual meaning. The cops would say this is a headlock, not, not an ideal way to do it. But even the NYPD has to acknowledge these are guidelines they have because in a life and death confrontation, in a serious confrontation, the rules vaporize real quickly. And that's just the reality. You know, what you were saying is, well, actually, I should say the way you are saying it. Sure. Is very adversarial. Because I have, time is short. That's why. Right. But, yep. but, the, but, but the fact <laughs> is sorry. that none of us, I believe, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm speaking for you, believe that the police are inherently evil. <laughs> we want good policing. We believe in good policing. We believe that there are good police officers out there. And, and, and we've all seen good police out there, but there has also been instances of incorrect police training, not enough police training, and police that have stepped out of line and have gone in directions that they should not be going in making arrests. Unfortunately, a lot of these times it has happened in communities of color to people of color. That being said... Whether I, the police officer is white, black, or, or Latino. Right. Right. That being said, you know, there was the, the other day in my neighborhood, I was watching as four or five police officers were talking to a man who had some sort of issue. Um, he obviously needed some mental health help and they were talking him down. I watched as they spent the better part of an hour in several different parts of my block talking to this man, never actually touching him until they got him to lie down on a stretcher and be put in an ambulance. Right. And the respect I had for those police officers was so high because they did not try to escalate that to something that could have turned into something so incredibly ugly. But, but they I, took I, I'm, I'm their run, job right. so... I, I take that point, and I, I apologize for running because I actually want to hear the... But uh, criminalizing, demonizing, bullying, threatening uh, the police is not a way to get good policing. The cops, if you know their job, are already uh, infantilized and they all want to get out as quick as, as tomorrow. And the idea of taking a guidebook that's this long, the cops break rules every day to get the job done, to keep the peace. And we're going to add it this way. Now the city council is going to add some more pages to a, to, a work, to, to a job that is literally, it's unwantable and it's undoable at this point. That is the hard truth. So I apologize for Thank you. Yep. Um, I wanted to respond to the yes, cynicism <laughs> that I've heard. Um, first of all, how many in this audience has cell phones that take pictures? I assume everybody, right? <laughs> it's a generational thing. I would rather see police officers with body cams. I'd rather see cams, uh, cameras in the video, in the, taking videos in radio cars. Uh, I think it protects the officers. I'll even go a step further. I'm a firm believer that all station house interrogations of individuals should be videotaped from beginning to end. And this is something I believed in for a long time. And it also, in that situation, uh, does away with uh, abusive techniques. It explains what occurred in a station house. And it, I think it not only protects individuals who are suspects, but it also protects the police officers. And I believe police officers believe that. And also, we all know about the Central Park Five. If you think about it for a moment, if, th if those confessions were videotaped in the station house, 
the day the, co the cops brought in those individuals, maybe the result would be a little different. And there was a Crown Heights case also of Lemerl, uh, Lemerick Nelson, I believe his name is. Uh, um, in the, the Crown Heights riot. Yes. Case. Uh, if that was videotaped, I think maybe the verdict could have been a little different. It probably could have been a conviction. Eleanor, I respect everything you say. I don't believe policing is inherently <coughs> evil. What I believe is the failure of the police <coughs> department to manage and train police <coughs> officers, yep. play, train police officers who are out there every day protecting us, is inherently evil. If you really want to, you know, go that far and make it very, mm -hmm. you know, glitzy. The failure of the police department, and, um, and then, of course, the council member can disagree with me, but in the last 20 years, going back to the days of uh, the police commission when Ray Kelly was a commissioner, everybody after that in the Giuliani administration, then we had Kelly, too, and Bratton, too. The failure of the police department to train cops out on the street led to the abuses of stop and frisk, which I believe is a good police tool, if done properly in accordance with the Supreme Court. But the police officers out on the street... They had a quota. Uh, well, they had a quota. That's police management, and they're the ones who have to be held responsible. But the police officers on the street have to understand what Terry v. Ohio is, and I'm going to sound like a lawyer for a moment. They have to understand what reasonable suspicion is. They have to have a gut instinct, and they may not get it right, as I said in my opening remarks, every single time. But they're doing it to the best of their ability, but they can't if they don't have the ability. And Gene, who left, I think was, had a very cynical view, and I will tell him when I speak to him personally, about the police department and cops. I think Pete, there are a lot of kids out there that want to be cops. They, want, they look at cops as role models. The question is, how do you get them not only to recruit them to bring them into the police department, but the other issue, very important, when you get Officer Lanceman or Officer Chris, who's there 15 or 20 years, how do you retain those individuals? I mean, when I was at the meeting last night uh, with the 9th Precinct, I saw these police officers. Some of them had been there two and a half years. Others had been 11. Others had been 35 years. And they were all so proud of the work that they had done. And these police officers that were out in the community were so happy to be able to be out in the community again, actually getting to meet the people in the community. And it was completely opposite of everything that he was just saying. So I don't know what policeman he's talking about. Maybe it's the corrupt policeman. Maybe oh, I it's think the there's clearly a sense of being. I think police have a have a bunker mentality in the sense that there's some of them, but there are when others well, that are really when have that really not felt under siege. It's a very very difficult. But that's job. A, also that's teachers. That, teachers feel yeah, under siege. I mean, well, no, and, they and, feel under political siege. I don't right, mean when we say under no, siege, we don't mean no, under physical. No, you know, some teachers shot at, do but, too. But but, just, do, but the fact is, there are some police officers. But definitely, depending on the precincts that they're in as well. But there are other police officers, even if they are feeling under siege, they're still very proud of mm -hmm. what they're doing and still really want to serve their communities and are not trying to flee. And the I agree fact with you. is that there are still people on those lists to be going into the academy. So I am not really sure where he's getting some of his information. Yeah, and a lot of what we're doing is helping police officers do the things that they became police officers to do. Cops on the beat will tell you they did not join the police force to, you know, toss a dozen people a day because they've got to meet some kind of stop and frisk uh, quota. They did not become police officers so they can arrest people for riding their bike on the sidewalk or being in the park after dark. So a lot of the work that we're doing to try to address overcriminalization and focus the police on real good community policing and real crime fighting, this is what cops joined the police department to do. And that's what they want to be doing. That's what they want let, to let me doing. just say, uh, community policing is not new. I was an assistant district attorney in 1973, so now you can figure out how old I am. Uh, but the bottom line really is we had community policing back then, and it was called the Neighborhood Stabilization Unit. Then we had, uh, later on, after I left the DA's office, community policing called CPOP, I believe. There's always been an attempt to do it. The, the, my sense really is, is if I'm right, and here's my premise, if we've wasted 20 years in failing to train and we're now looking at a new generation of police officers coming in, it may take, with these new officers, 20 years to change that culture. It would be a tremendous failure on the part of the police department, on us, to not allow them to try and make these officers better. 
New York City, like any big city, especially in certain neighborhoods in this city, and thank God crime is down to a great degree since when I was an assistant DA, we had hundreds of murders in Brooklyn. Hundreds. Three, four hundred just for the borough alone. Now you may have that many for the whole city of New York. And whatever the reasons are, for the social changes, the economic changes, maybe that's the answer. The waning of the crack epidemic. Wait, right. Crack, a whole bunch of things. But the, the key thing really is, is that you have to take these kids that are coming out of the police academy me. You have to educate them. They have a gun. They have a badge. They have the authority to make arrests. And they've got to be able to say when they go over to an individual that the radio call logo of courtesy, professionalism, <coughs> and respect is not just a logo on the car. This is the way they have to act. And it's just going to take time to do this. Let me take let me take a question. Tell us your name and your campus, please. My name is Diana Tavera. I attend Hostess Community College. My question is, in the area of school safety, what do members of the panel think about reduction or elimination of metal detectors in New York City public schools? That's an interesting question. It's uh, the school, the school safety union. I think that's um, uh, Floyd's union is very, very upset about that. Well, um, one of the is there, you know, and I guess more broadly, is there an overreaction to prompt to all these problem situations that there's a lessening of a safety infrastructure? So um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I graduated from Hillcrest High School in Queens in 1987, so now you can do the math on, on how old I am. Yeah, um, I graduated and, Brooklyn College in 1922, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a few years later, I, I came back as a, as a, as a, as a law student to, to teach a, a class to high school students. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was going into a prison. The metal detectors had gone up, the, the wands. We are making an effort to try to reduce the sense within our schools, from elementary school through high school, that these are um, prisons and to break what we commonly um, refer to as the uh, school to prison uh, pipeline. We are trying to reduce the use of suspensions and expulsions uh, which fall overwhelmingly on kids of color. Um, we are trying to uh, develop restorative justice models where problems that are at the source of, of some of this um, uh, misconduct are addressed within the school in constructive ways. But the issue of discipline in our schools is an extremely important one um, because that is where the tone and the expectations are set and where young people develop. Where they're socialized. Where are, are socialized and, and, and acculturated to being policed and over-policed. And that will manifest itself outside of the school in communities. Yes, ma'am. Um, good evening. My name is Veronica Pacheco, and I go to John Jay College. I have two questions uh, for Attorney Keys and Counsel uh, Lensman. If you will have the power to change the policing system, what will be the first thing that you will change? And the second question is, what's the biggest factor that's failing in the policing system, specifically in New York? Thank you. Uh, she said your name first. Oh, okay. Well, the first thing that I believe <coughs> is uh, the police commissioner. I come out of a uh, police department where I was young at the time, and the police commissioner was a civilian. He was 39, 39 going on 40 years old. He believes he's the youngest police commissioner. I know Teddy Roosevelt was. I didn't serve under Teddy Roosevelt. He was, uh, I, I was after him. Uh, but I believe the police department should be run by a civilian police commissioner. I like the look. I like the thought. I like the dimension of a civilian police commissioner because you're thinking outside of the four corners of that building. And that will set a tone for the way the police department should be governed. Uh, there's nothing wrong, I guess, with having a chief move up or somebody move through the ranks, but this is just a preference that I have. It's a different look. What was the other question? I'm sorry, I missed the... Um, what's the biggest factor that's failing in the police system? But, right. I'm sorry. Well, but what, you know, we, what's, the, what's the most singular failing, failing factor within oh, the police department? Oh, that, that's easy. Um, out of 34,500 cops, let me just say, the disciplinary system sees about 1,000 a year, thereabouts. Uh, so I, I'm not going to say discipline or the failure of discipline. 
because there is a disciplinary system and it does work. The public just doesn't understand it. What I think the biggest failure is, is what I said before in one of my remarks, is the failure to continuously train police officers, not just at the, the academy level, but think about it for a moment. You have police officers, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, and above to what I always do, the four-star chief of the department. These are the four stars that they wear. Each and every one of them should be trained annually, 14 months, on how to make arrests, how to take statements, how not to walk through crime scenes and be big feet and destroying for criminal defense attorneys like myself, which I love because, it, you know, I basically can argue to a jury and basically argue reasonable doubt. I think the failure to train right up to the four stars in the police department is the biggest failure. Because if you do this training on a regular basis and you basically educate them and teach them how to testify, you know, testifying in a courtroom, you're under oath. You swear to tell the truth. Juries have a tendency to look at police officers and not believe them. Because police officers will look at a defendant, I'm looking at you as a great questioner, not as a defendant, but look at you with a hostility and an attitude. As a criminal defense attorney, I thrive on that. As a prosecutor, yeah. my heart beats. Eleanor, this question of discipline, I mean, this has come up again in the case of Ms. Danner, who was just killed up in the killed up in the Bronx, where police protocol says you stabilize the situation and you wait for the emergency services unit, but that did not happen. Is that, I was talking in, the, in my opening about the corrosive quality. Is that feed, does that feed that corrosive quality? Does it become generalized when it's really not a generalized situation, that, that these are exceptions? I mean, how, that, how do you weigh all that out? Well, I mean, it just adds to the fodder of it happening over and over and over again. So sometimes it is something like the Mrs. Danner case. Other times it's the Eric Garner case. Or and the what, Akai Gurley case. Or the Akai Gurley case. And when you have it happening over and over and over again, it just mounts. And so it really doesn't matter what the individual case is. It's just another case that is happening. And so in that particular case, the fact that um, the mayor talked about it so swiftly. As, it, as was, did the police commissioner. As did the police commissioner. <coughs> doesn't really mean that much mm. because... A lot of the community thought they should have spoken out as quickly on so many of the other cases. However, the police unions reacted very swiftly, equal, you know, equally swiftly, saying you're prejudging the situation. As they have with every single one, with whoever said anything that was the, uh, against the police officer. The lack, the lack of accountability for police officers that engage in misconduct is um, astounding to most people and a source of tremendous irritation. We can go through the roster of police officers who um, have engaged in some form of misconduct. Look, I talked about the chokehold bill earlier. The CCRB uh, did a study on, on the number of substantiated... Civilian Complaint Review Civilian Board. Civilian Complaint Review Board did a, a study on the number of substantiated uh, accusations of the use of a chokehold. And within a certain period, let's say there was nine, the most severe sanction for any of the officers who committed that chokehold was the loss of uh, vacation days. <coughs> we just found out a few weeks ago that officers who were on modified duty um, pending adjudication of, of very s s serious uh, disciplinary charges um, have been getting overtime pay. I mean, the public feels like, like, what are we, stupid? Like, There's a mockery of and accountability. They and they also, don't, they also feel that they don't count. Right. And the de Blasio administ administration's new position on refusing to release information about disciplinary decisions for officers, um, fighting a court order, to uh, th that that information should be disclosed. I think people feel really re disappointed. Uh, l let me just say something. The council member raised a lot of good points. Accountability is key. Accountability starts at the top, works its way down. Uh, you're in charge of cops. If they make a, uh, a blunder out on the street, you may have to hold the sergeant, the lieutenant, the captain responsible. But there's one thing which um, uh, Rory mentioned, which is very troubling. In the years that I sat there, for the four years, believe it or not, I fired 55 police officers myself for all different violations, including CCRB violations that came to me. And even though it was a simple charge, the history of the police officer demonstrated that he was unfit to continue. What the police department has decided to do in the waning days of Commissioner Bratton, which has been ratified by... Uh, Mayor de Blasio, is not to make public 
disciplinary dis, uh, dispositions. I don't get it. I really don't get this uh, because it really sends a message not only to us that the police department is handling disciplinary problems, but it sends a very clear message to the other members of the service that this kind of conduct and I'm not talking about excessive force. You know, uh, you can have uh, officers that violated the sick leave policy, scamming the department to take days off. But they don't belong there. You can have police officers who have a disability, who lie about it, get a disability pension, and are out there working in a second job until they get caught. We have to know what's going on. Yes, ma'am. My name is Destiny Reyes. I go to John Jay College. Will Mayor de Blasio face accusations that he is soft on crime in 2017, especially if a Republican contender starts gaining numbers in the polls? Well, that's a, that's a good, you know, um, we are heading into a mayoral year. I mean, and this has uh, entered the presidential election, though I would argue that, uh, that, you know, Trump is such an unlikely candidate that you can't have a serious debate around issues in the president, you know, and, you know, he's not a credible man to do with discuss issues in detail, but, but the mayor will face, uh, will face the voters and he will face a uh, Republican challenger, might face Democratic challenges and police issues and the perception of safety, even if crime is going down, is always a factor in politics. Yes, it is always a factor in politics. And, you know, though a lot of people are not happy with the way the police department has been going and the way police policing has gone in New York, um, I think a Republican will have a pretty hard time saying, um, at least using the numbers, that saying that New York has gotten less safe. I think it's going to be uh, <coughs> Democrats on yeah, the other side here. that Excuse he's going to have more of hits from saying that... Uh, the way the police department is working is not the reforms that he said he was going to bring in when he took office. If you, uh, if you read the New York Times, I think it was last weekend, uh, there was a story that detailed the level of dissatisfaction with the mayor amongst his base, yeah. amongst communities of color, and amongst the progressive <coughs> wing of the Democratic Party, of which I am a part. You know, let me give you the, the short uh, explanation of, of public safety politics in New York City. The mayor ran as the police reform candidate. The encapsulation of that was the, the famous ad with his son, uh, Dante, and the mayor, Bill de Blasio. Candidate de Blasio was the most outspoken opponent of stop and frisk policing. There was an expectation that he was going to bring in real reform. He hired Commissioner Bratton, uh, brought back uh, Bill Bratton to be police commissioner. There was concern in the police reform community, to say the least, but there was a hope that Bill Bratton coming into the police department was kind of like Nixon going to China. Bill Bratton was going to be the implementer of all the reforms that Bill de Blasio had talked about. When the Eric Garner grand jury declined to um, indict. Indict. indict Officer Pantaleo, um, the mayor spoke out forceful, forcefully and I thought very bravely. That was the speech where he talked about the conversation that he as the parent of a black child had to have with his, with his kid. Then, officer Panther, officers Lou and Ramos were assassinated. The cops turned their back on the mayor. The mayor panicked and felt that he was going to lose uh, white support because um, he was going to be perceived as being anti-police. And from that moment forward, the mayor essentially handed the keys to public safety policy over to Commissioner Bratton, who constitutionally, <coughs> although a visionary as a police leader, is not exactly the kind of police reformer that we were expecting. And that's where we are today. Going into 2017, the political vulnerability that the mayor has is not from the right, from a, a potential mm -hmm. Republican, I don't believe, but as Ms. Tatum said, from within the Democratic Party, yes. people who are disappointed that we have not realized the kinds of reforms that we were promised. Let me try to get a few more questions in, please. My name is Anthony Street. I'm from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, Mr. Eugene uh, proposed a very interesting topic, which was um, the legislature's uh, demonizing uh, the police officers. And the power of that information is what's really scaring communities. And um, so 
these communities don't really go to their community meetings and things like that so they don't know what's really happening with police officers when it comes to taking care of the neighborhood so if um, we're talking about holding police officers accountable how would they get that information and what's the power of that information and how could it affect um, community policing if it's positive or negative what do you think I, I think we have to put the police actually into the communities so that the people will get to know the police and no longer be afraid to actually go into the precincts <coughs> to go and be a part of those meetings mm. and figure out how to bring them back in and to use the precincts not as a place of only of a discipline as a place that you don't want to be in but as a place of community where it is a place to go to get help, a place to learn about what's going on in your community, and a place that you can help to make your community stronger. That's what police precincts are supposed to be. And what has happened is that it, they've become demonized so much <coughs> because of what has happened with policing over the last 20 or so years. And that is really a shame because, I mean, I remember as a kid, we used to have police officers coming into our classrooms as elementary school kids and it was like officer friendly <laughs> who used to come in and talk to us. Now my six-year-old daughter, you know, I told her the other day, this is about a year ago, I said, honey, I need to go talk to the police officers across the street. She says, no, mommy, I don't want to go talk to them. I said, why, honey? She's like, I'm scared of them. And there's no reason why a five-year-old should be telling their mother that they're scared of the police. And we have to change that, but we also have to prove them wrong that they shouldn't be scared. Because right now, I can't say that they're not right. I, I think, Eleanor, you raise a good point, but the changing of the culture of the police department and to get it in sync now to try and relieve the community of its fears that have grown, as we all know, in the last couple of years, because we've seen the shootings not only in New York or the violence um, on both sides in New York, but across the country, is going to take time. Now, Absolutely. I have no patience. I am, <laughs> As Bob knows, I have the least patience in the world. I'll vouch for that. He'll vouch for it. But I know this is going to take uh, time to do. But I think also what the community has to understand, and I have a different view. I think what happened up in the Bronx, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Danda's, uh, Danda's case, I think the sergeant, and I know this is going to sound bad, but you've got to allow me to finish, uh, was basically who did the shooting, thrown under the proverbial bus at this point. I don't know except what I read in the newspaper. I don't know exactly how close she was to him, whether he had any other means, whether or not there were other officers in the room. We have no idea at all. It's a terrible loss. And I think the, the police commissioner and the mayor politicized the shooting, and that's the biggest mistake you can make in police shootings. It takes a while for a story to come out, for an investigation to get done. And I believe if it's done right, at the end of the day, Justice will be done. The process is important. But I just wanted to say one last thing. Yes, Going back to the young woman's question, I think we need to bring the police to where the people are, and that's the way that we're going to bring back that trust. And, and to tell the truth as far as what's going on. Yes, sir. My name is Saul Serrano. I go to John Jay of Criminal Justice, and my question is for Chris. How responsible is the council and the mayor for allowing this to happen with the culture shift, as you said? That's you. You're the council. Well, why did you you, take you it? wanted him or me? No, no you. I mean, him. why did he? Yeah. Uh, uh, You're Chris. And, but which I'm mayor Chris, but and he's which the council? council member. For for this council, to I mean, the, I mean, one of the <laughs> questions is how can you? Can well, you I'm really, biased. I'm, so he wants an honest. Right. He wants an honest. No, but can you really legislate a cultural shift? No. In no. A, in a police department. I'll tell you what you should do. And and uh, Rory, who's a good council member from Queens. And I mentioned it to him as we were about to get started here. I believe the city council. They're made up of 51 representatives that cover the city of New York, have a legislative responsibility to recommend laws to Albany and recommend uh, laws to, for the administrative code, for example, that covers police officers. They have one thing that I think is critical. They have the oversight responsibility. They can look by conducting hearings and bringing in police officers and bringing in experts <laughs> and asking them, why has this happened? And notwithstanding, I know how aggressive, in a good way, Councilmember 
Lanceman is, then I believe the council has to be aggressive when it comes to policing and ask on behalf of their constituents why this has occurred. And that's what my, my sense is. Hopefully that answered that, that question. It's yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Natalie Giaccio from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I work for a community board in the Bronx, so I'm a little familiar with policing and whatnot. Our uh, overschooling and overcrowded schooling is at 130 capacity, and it's increasing. Also, our gun violence is increasing. I was wondering if you think there's a definite correlation between education and our incarceration system. Well, I mean, that's a, I mean, you want to handle that? Well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you have an educated populace, you've got a lower rate of, of prison population. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen in this city, I mean, we do have a school to prison pipeline and we do have a prison industrial complex. And the fact is that we incarcerate way too many people and we do not educate enough of our young people and if we educated more people and if we actually did reform inside prisons uh, rehabilitation inside prisons we would have a very different outcome and our country would be a much better place we have a minute and a half left let's get one last question in uh, ricardo garcia john jay college of criminal justice and my question is for the councilman uh, you laid out some uh, earlier during the discussion some fantastic uh, reform policies that city council is looking to initiate but um, one of the key aspects um, that I actually have is how do you change the actual uh, mentality of the police department where they look at individuals as in, as individuals and not as Which, uh, this gets into the question or, or, or potential. This gets into the question of explicit <laughs> or implicit bias. So I mean, can you legislate that out of a human being? <laughs> well, the, so so let me talk about two approaches to that. Good. In the next right. 50, 50 seconds. seconds. Yes. The first is, if we increase in accountability within the police department, where officers know and feel that misconduct, big or small, is going to be um, uh, exposed, uh, dealt with, uh, and punished, that will play a big role in changing a culture that now feels like a culture of, of impunity within um, the department. Um, and, and then the second thing is, in terms of treating people like individuals, you know, the council fought for 1,300 new police officers, which Commissioner Bratton um, had wanted and the mayor originally resisted, in large part to be able to give the cops the chance to get out of their cars and meet people. Let me, uh, let me grab this. As we're, I've gotten the goodbye sign. I always make deadline. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on uh, CUNY Forum.